I'm Sean. I'm Adam. This is Sasquatch. The first film we're going to be covering on the show is the 2002 film Sasquatch, also known as The Untold. Uh, I wanted to cover this film first because this is the first Bigfoot movie that I actually watched uh, when I was much younger. I saw it on the Sci-Fi channel, and I was really excited to watch it because I love killer animal films. I love any film that features an animal, uh, preferably a large, oversized animal, but I'll take what I can get. Anything that involves them eating or killing or both of human beings. I'm a big fan of those. So the Sci-Fi Channel was a, a major stay in my viewing experience as a younger person. So I watched this movie and I hated it. <laughs> I remember hating it a lot, and I was very disappointed at the amount of Bigfoot we got in the movie, and uh, that stayed with me for a long time. Uh, and since then, I've watched other Bigfoot films, and I've come to find, in retrospect, that this is actually one of the, the better ones. I don't think that's gonna, gonna be possible at all. No, I think this is gonna be a high watermark. I think that's what I hope find. that's not true. I mean, it is... I mean, I don't remember the other ones that I've really seen in the past. I'm sure we'll revisit them, but yeah, I don't remember this being better than any of those. I, I hope to forget this one in time as well. Well, let's start with the plot of okay. this film. So okay. what is Sasquatch <laughs> or The Untold? What's it about? people that are sent to rescue a downed airplane um, that we find belonged to this company owned by uh, Lance Henderson's character. Harlan Knowles. You know something? I love sailing so much. The Maverick CEO is our lead character. So it's like six of them. I believe he works for a company called Viatech. That's Harlan Knowles. You've heard of him, right? President and CEO of Viacomp Technologies. It's a rescue team of six people, including a Maverick CEO, a shady insurance business lady. So what's with the insurance rep picking up the tab? Mr. Knowles said something about a piece of research equipment lost on the plane. I guess her company figures it's cheaper to go see if we can get it than pay the claim. A computer nerd that just so happens to be really into cryptozoology. Look, new animal species are being discovered every day, you know? Um, most of the time, it's like some new kind of beetle or an albino earthworm, but every once in a while, they come across something big. Uh, a semi-famous survival guide, a mountain man, and uh, I think another in a forensics investigator that does absolutely nothing. Oh, uh... The six people are going to try and find this plane to find out if the see if Harlan Knowles' daughter is still alive. There's this company piece of equipment that they're alluding to finding on the plane that that the plot really wants us to invest in. So they get up there and they're looking for the plane, and then they find the plane in Bigfoot attacks. That's basically the plot of the film. There's not a whole, whole lot there. Well, there's a little bit more to it when you get down to, you know, Bigfoot's motivations and the character and how they interact. Um, so the plane that went down, and, I mean, obviously all of these reviews are going to be spoiler heavy. Um, so the plane goes down, and we find later in the movie that uh, the plane actually killed another Bigfoot that was in the area, and the original Bigfoot was killing the people on the plane for revenge. What's initially appealing about it is that it, it, it feels like a stripped-down, basic adventure Bigfoot plot. And at first you're like, okay, we've got a rescue team, we've got Lance Henriksen, it seems like they're going to play this like a classic kind of creature movie. But it only takes a few scenes for the, the script to start to fall to shreds. Because if you're like, okay, there's the insurance businesswoman who's here funding the rescue team. But she immediately starts with this like weird, like 
sexual tension with Lance Henriksen where she's like flirting with him and you're a little bit confused like why she's wearing this like pink coat to go deep into the mountains on a rescue team. Why don't you mind your own goddamn business? <laughs> and then they get to this plane and they introduce this Huxley thing and it's this box about, about the size of an accordion. Uh, there's something we need to find, something that was on this plane. Yeah, what? It was a metal box about the size of an accordion that uh, has a strap on it. Hey guys, what's up? Where'd you find that? Yes, about the size of an accordion. <laughs> In 2002, it's this box that you're supposed to be able to take any DNA, like a piece of hair, and they put it into the box, and it just opens up this little computer interface, and it can tell you, like, the complete DNA history. You want to see what it does? Allow me. Ow! Here, try that. It's coming up now. You're a woman? Yeah. Uh, you are 1 16th black on your mother's side. You had a heart disorder when you were a child, and you need glasses. And this is this is ridiculous. It makes absolutely no sense. Like, where? How does? What is the machine? What is, where does the box? How much of it is just like the stuff they feed into it? Like, where'd that hair go? In a little trash compartment in the bottom? Maybe it's like a printer. You just open it up and throw it in the middle. And yeah, and they make all this big deal that it's the prototype, and the scientist who made it was on the plane, so Lance has this horrible scene. Oh, he was on the plane? The guy who made it was on the plane. Oh, uh, yeah. I thought that he had just died, <laughs> no, he died. otherwise beforehand. <laughs> Professor Ivan Malik, a couple of years ago, created Project Huxley. This is the prototype the only one in existence. And now, unfortunately, it's his epitaph. Whatever, whatever. They have two other ones, but this guy was just so smart that when they tried to reverse engineer them, they just he broke them. They couldn't do they it. They just couldn't do it. <laughs> so they go up there for like, and the movie tries to make like a plot point about is Lance going up there to look for his daughter or to look for Huxley? But they're both on the same plane, so at no point are you like, man, he's really over-prioritizing Huxley. Like, why wouldn't you grab it if you're point. there? It just doesn't, people try to make it into a thing and it doesn't need to be. All right, look, we did come up here to search for survivors. That tin box is the future of my corporation. Hey, listen, this ain't no game. There definitely is something up here. Something that can drag 5,000 pounds of airplane through miles of bush. Something that can rip a man's arm off and take a grizz down with a rock. Once. Bigfoot has finally started to attack these characters. And it's it's a long wait to get to that point. And all of a sudden, somebody just says, like, hey, we've he's after Huxley. Bigfoot's clearly after Huxley. And he wants us to destroy Huxley or he's going to kill us. And I don't know what they based that off of. I don't know what happened, <laughs> what scene in the movie got cut where they were like, Oh, obviously Bigfoot understands what this box does. Because they I even guess... asked that question at one point. I believe Lance <laughs> Henriksen does. Yeah, he's like, "What do you mean? <laughs> what does he know about biology? <laughs> Your biotech. It's Bio what does he know about computers? <laughs> what does it know about biotech, or GPS, or computers? Yeah, and I guess they must have fed some of Bigfoot's hair into it. So they're trying to say that oh, Bigfoot's but trying they never, to stay. They hidden definitely on never showed that, right? Um, they might. Have. I Maybe think. They, the I think that they the said was the people it? on the plane did it. Uh, okay. Yeah. See, every life form on Earth is recorded in Huxley's database by direct sampling or cross reference. This reads like a finding. Yeah, but homology is unlike anything I've ever seen before. I mean, the sampling was done ten weeks ago, just days after the crash. They used blood. Years of of hoaxes and blurry pictures, and we've got the first scientific evidence of the Sasquatch's existence. I mean, a complete genetic breakdown. This is history, the most important anthropological discovery, like, ever. Don't, don't even. Priceless. It's irrefutable. So they tell Lance, they're like, hey, if you don't leave the box, we're going to leave you here. And Lance is just like, well, sure, like, that's fine. And then he, like, Homer Simpson's back into these ferns. It's pretty great. You got to leave it behind. Arlen, it either stays here by itself or with you. Fair enough. That thing killed my daughter. What are you, you doing? Go on, I'll take my own chance. Harlan, come back here! Harlan! But the very end of the movie, Lance finds the body of another Bigfoot. And, like, through the power of 
exposition being played overhead, you understand that the plane hit a Bigfoot and that this Bigfoot that had murdered two members of his party, he's like, oh, he's just a grieving family member the same way I am. So in that understanding, Lance Hendrickson shoots Huxley. They share like a look of understanding and the Bigfoot leaves and that's the end of the movie. And it's just the most ludicrous thing you could possibly imagine to that Bigfoot would understand that this, there's even a line. Just drop the box, Harlan. It's a goddamn animal. Look, it may not understand what these things actually do, but through us, it senses the danger. Our- if there's only six characters in the movie, let's, and we spend a lot of time with them. So mm-hmm. there's Harlan Knowles. What'd you think of Harlan Knowles? Um, Lance Henriksen's fun to watch. I don't think that, I necessarily think that he's incredible, but I think that he's just entertaining in the kind of stuff that I've seen him in before and in this. So I'm a big Lance good, fan. Good for him. And he's good at doing a lot with his face. He's a good at like showing you something in a scene when he doesn't really have any lines or clear motivation. So that's good on him. But at the same time, there's very few scenes in the movie where Harlan actually gets to do a whole lot. He's mostly standing there, frowning. He looks cold. He looks tired. I felt <laughs> bad for Lance, but I also got a lot of enjoyment out of watching how how uh, upset he looked at times during the movie. Um, there's one part where he's on the ground digging. <laughs> it just looks so cold. <laughs> um so I enjoyed that part of Harlan, but it's it's just very rare. The only scenes that he gets to really like have a character moment come off as really silly or weird because of like there's like the cockpit scene where he starts talking about sailing out of nowhere. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> she hated me. She thought I was responsible for her mother's death. Why? You know something? I love sailing so much. It kept my family together. <laughs> Get my marriage whole. That's the kind of man he is. He's got a, a thin string <laughs> holding his life together. He's a haunted man. Winston Berg, who's like the, the survival guide, and then Clayton is like the mountain man. And so there's like the rich guy and like the local poor guy that are both there. And the reason that their characters are the best two characters is they're the only two that makes any kind of sense to actually be on this mission. Like maybe the forensic investigator... But if it's like a rescue mission to look for survivors, why wouldn't you just immediately send some people yeah, that know how the woods... I mean, I don't know a lot about forensics, but I thought that they generally were focused on solving crime. Plaz was there to deliver cryptozoology exposition that nobody needs because everyone knows who Bigfoot is. Like, there's the title of the movie, I guess when they thought it was The Untold, they thought that it would be more of a mystery to, like, what's in the woods, but I don't know that that makes any sense because 10 minutes into the movie, Plaz is like, you guys know a Bigfoot lives out here, right? And it's like, well, (laughs) what is that foreshadowing? What could that be leading to? And then there's uh, Marla, is the worst character in the movie. And so she comes in and she's trying to blackmail Harlan because apparently she quit her job at the insurance company after finding out that... Viatech was leveraged to the hilt because they're missing their Huxley that they can't remake. So that's why he's going into the woods to get Huxley. And all of that is poorly delivered. And it's secondary to her strange motivation to flirt with Harlan. And then after that, there's like this really weird out of nowhere scene where she like starts undressing in the tent and the camera starts rotating. Uh, and it's just really strange and pervy out of nowhere. <laughs> but I guess Bigfoot shows up on the other side of the tent and starts dragging her through the woods. <laughs> ha ha, very funny. I'm scared. <laughs> the next night, She decides to go out naked into the hot spring in the Canadian mountains. Unaccompanied. (laughs) No, she makes Harlan come with her. Oh, right, right. (laughs) And you're just like, hey, hold on. Like, let's set aside the fact that you supposedly had an important job at an insurance company. (laughs) 
You just got dragged through the woods by what everyone said must have been a grizzly bear last night. And you're getting naked and going into the hot spring (laughs) the next night. It's just weird. And then when she gets killed, which happens later off screen, she decides to grab Huxley and just run off with Huxley. And you're like, hey... If you had gotten out of the As woods... As if she's going to, like, sell it or yeah. ransom it back to them or something. <laughs> she but. had already struck a deal to get $30 million in stock when she knew that Huxley was going to make them all this money. And instead, she's just going to grab Huxley and run through the woods without the nature guide. <laughs> to what? Sell Huxley on the black market? <laughs> Is that what <laughs> she's going to do? There's one in the world. There's no way that they're not going to be able to recover that. Yeah. But let's talk about... The technical side of this movie. Because I feel like, at times, there are some genuinely cool-looking shots in the movie. Like, the wilderness that they're in looks really cool. Take what you need. we got to find her. But, at the same time, all of that cool wilderness is throttled by the editing in this film. fade-ins and fade-outs, <laughs> screen rotations, or I don't even know if it was a fisheye. What was that strange? When they would just go crazy and yeah. just start swirling. I don't know. I don't know. There was this blown-up <laughs> screen for some of the chases, <laughs> and it was... Yeah, it's like they took the image and they just stretched it, and then they kind of did this to it, and they started doing this. <laughs> <laughs> And you're watching it and you're like, this would be really cool if they would cut that out. If they would just <laughs> leave it however they... Yeah, because Bigfoot doesn't look that bad here. Sasquatch, I'm sorry. Or should we call him the untold? The director sounded like he was pretty disappointed in some of the, the editing choices, I would say. I don't know who had the power there. If it was the producers kind of making the calls, that's what it feels like. <laughs> he starts the commentary by saying movies are about compromise, if that tells you anything um every scene feels like it's cut in half and and a scene will start and then it'll fade out and you'll be like wait a minute nothing really happened there that was just some needless like walking and talking the kills really feel like uh they said in the commentary that they were trying to make this like a serial from the 30s and 40s and have it be like a classic adventure vibe so they were like happy that there wasn't a lot of gore but it feels like they just didn't have time to shoot any yeah, that kill scenes. I didn't get that vibe from it anyway. Even if that <laughs> was didn't. what they were trying. Classic adventure like Indiana Jones. They said, more classic. Like, they said uh, they thought of the Winston Berg characters having like a Clark Gable feel. I think he had a, a Clark Gable mustache. So <laughs> that's what they were able to pull off. <laughs> Friend, it's no good. Uh the commentary that I listened to really did answer a lot of my suspicions where I was they specifically said that Lance was getting cranky <laughs> and they would point out and be like there's Lance in the rain again and my uh My favorite thing that I learned from the commentary was that Lance went out of his way to make sure that his character's costume was, I guess it's like a a sailor's vest or like a sailor jacket that's made out of 100% Teflon. So they were saying the rain would just roll off of Lance (laughs) and that everyone would be soaking wet and he'd be the driest guy on set. (laughs) So... It confirmed that Lance was wet and cold during this this shoot. (laughs) Yeah, I just wish that they had had more than 12 days, because it really does show in the end. And I guess if you're only going to have 12 days, why didn't you film more Bigfoot when you had him? Clearly, you had him long enough to have him walk through the woods there. Wow. Why did we have to spend all this time explaining Huxley instead of just killing these kids that are in the woods. I just don't get it. They're not kids. No, they're not kids, but still, they could have killed them. 
they they talked a lot about in the commentary how they put a lot of work into making Bigfoot accurate. And this is, I found interesting, both because it's a big misstep for this movie, and I'm curious to see how many of these films shoot themselves in the foot trying to make Bigfoot accurate where they made sure to have the movie take place in the Pacific Northwest, where, according to this film, most of the Bigfoot sightings happen. I feel like in the few things that I've seen, that always seems to be a setup, at least in the documentaries that I've seen for sure. They're always like, you know, there have been ten reports of Bigfoot in these woods in the past, like, eight years or something like that, and then they'll come in and... Well, they also spent time, like, tracking the history of evolution to have the Bigfoot look like he's supposed to look like. But Bigfoot doesn't look like anything because he doesn't exist. Uh, So all this time they spend quoting the cryptozoology tech throughout the film to be like, oh, Bigfoot actually smacks antlers on trees and that's how he makes that sound. It's like, A, nobody knows that. So it just feels random when it happens. And B, like, it's not true. Bigfoot can be whatever... You want him to be. I don't care. That's an example of building on the mythos that I'm not really looking for. I don't need them to say that this is how, you know, Bigfoot is or should be. I want them to just do something cool that makes some amount of sense. And it killed him all for revenge. very last scene of the movie after Lance has murdered Huxley this supercomputer machine that would have changed everything about the size of an accordion (laughs) the size of an accordion (laughs) (laughs) yeah it, it just like he's standing there and the movie straight up cuts to hard credits It's text appears. Text on As screen. though it would in a, you know, <laughs> a, the aftermath of a movie based on a true story or something like that. Oh, yeah. Also, like, where's the case? Hold on. Where, the, where is that case? Just to clarify that, A, this cover, this picture you see on the movie is not what Sasquatch looks like in the movie. Mm -mm. So if you see that, if you're at your local, you know, flea market and there's like the DVD guy who's got like all of the tables and you see this and you're like, hey, that looks pretty cool. This is not in the movie, first off. Second of all, based on a true story is in (laughs) text right at the bottom there. I didn't, they never... (laughs) Hey. Iterated that in any way yeah. during the course of the film, what? and even, even uh, a, they didn't even attempt to. I don't think that no. anything in the movie tried to make it seem like it was based on a true story. Huxley never happened for sure. I can tell you, in two thousand and two, there was not yeah. a supercomputer the size of an accordion that you could feed hair into, and it would tell you if somebody needs glasses. That didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't happen. Maybe a plane crashed one time in the mountains of British Columbia. I think that's probably the extent of the true story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it cuts to hard text at the very end, and it just tells you, like, all those people that didn't get killed in the movie, they're fine. They, they made it out. The one guy, it says the computer guy went insane. Yeah, <laughs> he, he claimed that Sasquatch attacked them all, and the rest of them said that nothing like that happened, and he ended up getting committed. Can you imagine according that? According to that text. Even if you like the Winston Berg guy was like uh, an unlikable character that they didn't like, and like the insurance lady was trying to blackmail Harlan. But imagine like you're in a rescue team and two people are murdered by Bigfoot and you get back to society and you just flatly deny that Bigfoot was there. You're just like, yeah, no, they were not coming back. I don't know what to tell you. And for you know, what? Tell their families. To what <laughs> end? <laughs> what? what danger is there in the world knowing that Bigfoot exists? We'd be safer, I would assume. We'd be right, because like, okay. then we, we, he's probably an endangered species. It, people don't see him very often, so yeah. let's cordon off the area, we'd get a new national park out of it. Yeah, well, a it's big, Canada, an but. international park, I would say. Oh no! We're trapped! 
What do you think? In the overall context of the Bigfoot culture, do you think this film adds anything, or do you think it fits properly into uh, the Bigfoot mythos? I haven't heard of any Bigfoot that could dodge bullets that's, until okay. now, so that's something. No, I mean, their Bigfoot really had this desire to remain hidden, but it was kind of dumb, so... It was more than kind of dumb. Yeah, it was pretty that was dumb. being light. It was really dumb, so... I don't think that's going to carry over. I think there's something interesting about it, but not really. I think it hits enough boxes of, like, what people say are confirmed Bigfoot stats that if you're a Bigfoot enthusiast, you'd probably recognize some stuff but if you don't know a whole lot about bigfoot you're not going to walk away from this film feeling like you've learned some of his behavior because it all comes off as random Mm -hmm. and at the end of the day bigfoot's in the movie so little that i just don't see anybody i see the, the bigfoot fans walking in and feeling like they showed up for bigfoot and got a really cold and irate lance henriksen and I feel like the non-Bigfoot people are watching this movie and they're thinking, like, why am I watching this movie? What is... That was my question. The first time we watched it, I started falling asleep toward the end, partly because I was tired, but mostly because uh, I was just not enjoying myself. Um, then I watched it again and uh, <laughs> didn't like it anymore the second time. So I would say I kind of like this movie, Almost begrudgingly, I, you know, is this is coming from the initial reaction of hatred that I had about 15 years ago when this movie and I first parted, you know, first met each other. Um, so it's things have improved. I would say my rating for this film would be two and a half big feet. I'll give it uh, two big feet. Two big feet. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I think that averages it out at like two and Mostly for the editing. I can't, can't <laughs> get past some of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. If it weren't for the editing and if there was a little more Bigfoot, I would be a big fan of this movie. I'd be like, yeah, it's not great, but it's really fun. But I I'm still sorry, wouldn't. it's not. It's not terribly fun. Uh, unless you're going to laugh at Lance being cold and like when he falls in the mud. I really, really appreciate it whenever somebody will go the extra mile to make a practical effects Bigfoot. So while I'm not going to say that I was totally satisfied by the presentation at the end of the movie, I was happy that at least there was a physical Bigfoot there, uh, because that is not the case for a lot of these films. Um, Now, I know there's the tragedy of the effects person who made the original Bigfoot, They weren't able to recreate that same quality for the big scene at the end. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really sad. But at the end of the day, the creature we got at the end was a bit of a compromise. It isn't it's not that he looks bad. It's that he looks weird is my big thing, because like you expect Bigfoot to be hairy all over. Yeah. And it's just strange that he's bald. And I don't understand how he became a bald man. And I don't... Like, how was there not extra hair that they could have just put on the top of his head? Or It wasn't they... just his head. There were parts on his arm and other places yeah. where he was... He just had these patches of fur. You know, if they had laced him in for more of the movie, I think I'd be more forgiving. I than... think so, too. I was going to make that point. Uh, he's not in the movie for a great amount of time, at least on screen, so... Yeah, to have to wait almost the entire film to finally get Bigfoot. And then you see Bigfoot and it's this bald man standing there, you know, and then you throw the Huxley stuff in and it's just all becomes very silly. But I'm curious to know if we hit any other bald big feet as we go through these films. This is the only bald Sasquatch that comes to my mind. What kind of special abilities did Bigfoot have here? Well, this Bigfoot has night vision. Which originally led me to believe that um, 
he may be um, nocturnal, but uh, that didn't seem to be the case because the uh, third act of the film takes place largely in broad daylight, so it seems like, you know, he's he's up and about. There's not a lot of continuity between the POV shots. At some points in the movie, you're like, okay, Bigfoot has, like, predator vision. By the end of the movie, there were shots where I was like, I don't understand how Bigfoot can see at all. Like, how does he even get between trees Right. if he, this is what he looks like through his eyes? Maybe that's what they were trying to say. That's what it looks like in the daytime as opposed to his night vision, nighttime view. That's why they had this weird-looking lens on. And and it seemed like he was maybe somewhat intelligent because he did have, you know, another family member that he wanted to get revenge on. He didn't attack the airplane. He attacked the people in the airplane. So, I mean, there's... For, no, for this movie to assert that Bigfoot understood the threat of Huxley, not just that it would hurt him, but that it represented an existential threat of discovery, this has got to be a pretty intelligent creature. This has got yeah. to be a Bigfoot that can crunch the numbers and strategize in a way that makes you question why he's living in the forest. Yeah, I question at that point why he's doing cave paintings. I mean, that's an intelligent signal, but certainly not on that level. And then why he, you know, uh, why does he store bodies? Did you notice he had a big storage of bodies? Yeah, he had the big storage place for the bodies. And again, it didn't seem like they were torn apart or eaten. It just seemed like he kind of shoved them in a place. Yeah. You know, like a cat Dragged them there. No idea. How many Bigfoot there are? We just know there are multiple ones. I um, guess only two. He didn't have any other friends to ask to help out. Yeah, I guess That's what so. it seemed like. I don't know, maybe they don't communicate with each other, but then why did he care so much? Bigfoot seemed like he's really good at, like, jumping around. He didn't do it very often, but at the end he kind of, like, jumps, like, 40 feet holding through the a, air. He's holding a giant log. Strong, too, as you would expect. He's holding a huge log, and... And uh, at one point, he apparently broke a bear's neck. So yeah. we didn't see that, of course. That was off screen. But Yeah, that was off screen, thankfully. I, didn't, I don't want to see that on screen. Yeah, that's um, fair. That's fair. I, I question what Bigfoot does eat. If not people, does he eat bears? Because he didn't eat that one he killed. No, he didn't. I assume he has to be an omnivore. Like, I mean, he's kind of a I didn't see a lot of bears gorilla. out there. I didn't either. There was a hot spring, I guess. We didn't see him try to eat anything, though, so who knows? Well, we've got something else for you. We've got Stats Watch. So the first thing we have is the first appearance of Bigfoot in the film. In this film, he appears as a shadow 17 minutes into the film. And then you can see his eye a few minutes later at 19 minutes and not his whole body until nearly the end of the film. The total time that Bigfoot is on the screen is 2 minutes and 24 seconds. Uh, This film takes place in British Columbia in the country of Canada. Do you like the idea of a Canadian Bigfoot? I don't. Because, I mean, if we're talking about killer Bigfoot movies, a nice Bigfoot is not necessarily the thing that we want to be working with. And he did seem fairly polite as far as Bigfoots go. There's someone that just feels like... I don't know. I don't. I don't want my Bigfoot to be Canadian. I don't. I don't know mind why. if he's Canadian. I just want him to be a little more angry. In addition to that, we track the kills here. So we've got a spot here for on-screen kills and off-screen kills. Uh, you'll notice that only one of those has uh, ticks in it, and that's because this movie has three kills, and all three of them are off-screen. So that's another disappointing aspect of the movie, and uh, that will wrap up Stats Watch. <laughs> I hope that you've enjoyed the first episode of Sasquatch. I know I have. I've had a blast re-watching this film for the seventh time and really digging into it, analyzing it. Did you enjoy the experience? Sure. But I want to let you guys know that on the next episode of Sasquatch, we're going to be covering the 2005 film Sasquatch Hunters, which also played on the Sci-Fi Channel quite a bit. Is that a sequel to Sasquatch? I am curious to answer that question. I would say no, but I believe that it was probably originally supposed to be a sequel, or at least that's what that's the story I get from putting the posters next to each other. That's coming. Someone or something. Brian?